Welcome to the Azure for Sports podcast, hosted by the Azure for Sports team at Microsoft. Welcome to the latest edition of the Azure for Sports podcast. I'm Suzanne Tedrick, and as always, I'm joined by my Azure partner in crime, Mr. John Flynn. What's going on, John? Hey, Suzanne, good to see you again. We're back on video as we're well. We're on video. We're, we're moving up in the world. We're getting our production values on point. I'm loving the, the intro. <laughs> I tell you, production values are shot through the roof, right? Uh, so I'm excited about this, and I'm super excited about today's episode as well. Absolutely. We're really pleased to welcome Chris Traeger, the executive director of Boomtown Accelerators, to our podcast. And they have been doing amazing work in innovation in sports tech, really bringing the, the forefront of technology into the industry. And we're, we're excited to learn more. So, Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and talk to you guys today about what's been going on in the world of accelerators and, and sports tech. Amazing. Well, let's start off our conversation by talking a little bit about yourself, your background, and a little bit about Boomtown Accelerators. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've had kind of a unique background where I've done a little bit of everything. And uh, unlike most people, I really, every time I take a new step in my career, I try to do something that's 75% different than the last step. And so the, the reason for that is I'm a voracious learner. I love trying to try new things. Um, and so I started out my career as an attorney. I was in-house counsel for Octagon, general counsel, and worked my way up through the ranks there and got a really broad purview of the entire sports industry, working on transactions and events across the world and uh, working with the best in the business there. And then I had a chance to go over to Bank of America and lead their sports marketing efforts for the NFL at first, and then also Major League Baseball and NASCAR and some NGBs and uh, the USOC, as well as running the Chicago Marathon. Uh, Bank of America actually owns the marathon and operates it. And so I did that for a while. And then after uh, 10 years total at Bank of America, I decided to, to leap over to NASCAR and work for them at a key, key moment in time because the race team alliance had just formed and they were uh, considering purchasing some of the tracks back from their their sister company isc which has now happened and so i was able to help the industry kind of rally and get the teams and the tracks and the sanctioning body and their digital properties as well as their media partners to get on the same page and develop a new platform and a more integrated approach to sponsorship and media and then uh went out to las vegas and led a sales team um that uh, helped sell out Allegiant Stadium in record time and so for the Raiders. And so we sold season tickets and suites and, spo and sponsorships, naming rights. And that was a fascinating uh, roller coaster ride and uh, did some really fun stuff out there. And most recently, I've been working with earlier stage companies and joined Boomtown about a year and a half ago. And uh, our mission is to help Comcast, NBC, Universal, our, our client and partner, to find new companies that can help them improve their business in some way, shape or form. And, and also the, the business of their partners that are part of the program. I just have to say, I, I love your background. I love that you, you have just decided to, you know, you, you, you did phenomenally in the, in the legal world. And you said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and kick butt in someplace else. And I'm really going to make my mark. And your experiences are so diverse and they sound like they're so much fun. Um, so <laughs> kudos for taking that initiative to say, I'm going to blaze a new trail in, in something else and do something unique and, and fun. That's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's been really interesting. I, I think I was a little bit ahead of my time. You know, they say that millennials um, will often switch careers five or six times and they'll switch jobs much more frequently. And I, I wasn't... Um, and obviously not a millennial, but uh, definitely somebody who likes to try new things. There, there were moments in time where it felt like it was a little overwhelming to do something totally different. But I really think that's the only way you maximize your potential to, to, to see what you can do. I was fortunate along the way to be able to spot, you know, people talking about transferable skills. And, and that's how I convinced people that I could go from lawyer to marketer and marketer to strategist and operations person and then sales and now innovation and all that stuff. And so it's, it's about transferable skills and continuous learning and making sure that you, um, you know, the great part about having the legal background is you actually can learn more effectively both sides of a problem or argument. And so it actually helps you accelerate your learning because you get the whole Socratic method and balancing perspectives and things like that. So 
that's kind of the common thread is, is that learning and then just uh, being being a deal maker, helping people get around the table and agree on things. Having that background has to be incredibly helpful for the, the work that you're doing with uh, within the startup economy. And just thinking a little bit about that, when we hear the term accelerator, for those that may not be familiar with the startup ecosystem, what, what exactly does an accelerator do? Yeah, it's really interesting. I didn't know much about accelerators before I joined Boomtown. Um, so the the traditional accelerator, you know, Boomtown's been in, in business for about nine years and, and we've done dozens of accelerators and hundreds of companies and, and invested in a lot of startups. And the original design was to take a, an early stage company, somebody who has an idea or maybe a prototype, and then put them through a 12 week training curriculum, if you will, very educational based and prep those startup leaders to lead a business and to help pitch potential investors to, to attract investment in early seed rounds, things like that. And then also help them identify what kind of problems they can solve and, and product market fit and customer fit and things like that. And there are elements of our program now that have the, some of those themes in them, but we've been evolving the, the theme of the accelerator over the last 24 months to be something quite a bit different than the original you know 12 week program that has a demo day at the end. That's awesome. And I, I think, one of the things we need to do here is is change your title to to the world's most interesting man, right? Because I think some of the things that you've done, um, one thing that you can't fake is passion, right? And and I've had the privilege of sitting across the table from you a couple of times here, and you've got that in spades, right? I mean, you bring your entire self into this, and and the sports sports is your jam, right? Let's just call it what it is, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, your entire career is built around that entire north star, which is sports, which is beautiful to see. Um, so you're in a very, very unique position and also a very enviable position. You straddle that line between today and tomorrow mm -hmm. from a sports tech perspective, right? right? So in your view and being so close to this, where do you see the industry, the sports tech industry? I know it's a very large and broad question. Where do you see that heading from everything that you're seeing right now, Chris? Well, it's, it's probably the most fascinating moment in time to be involved in technology at the intersection of sports. The world today is very different than, than pre-pandemic. What got me interested in, in technology, you know, I'm, I'm not a coder, I'm not an engineer. I was a history major of all things. But what got me interested in technology was, you know, when I went, went out to, well, it started when I was at NASCAR, I had some smaller early stage tech companies approach me and say, hey, we want to work with the race teams and can you help us with that? And so I started helping them try to tell their story more effectively just because I thought it was a good thing for the industry and, and NASCAR that the teams could benefit. And then when I went out to Vegas, I kept getting calls from, from early stage companies. We want to work with the Allegiant Stadium and we want to you know, have our tech be deployed to fans in Vegas. And so I started focusing on what is the technology infrastructure necessary in order to improve the fan experience? So what kind of tech stack can, can the team build with the stadium that involves hardware, software, cloud-based services, and can you can you just make people uh, people's journey engaging with the team both in the stadium and outside? Can you make that a better set of reactions or interactions? We actually had a, a really cool relationship with a variety of companies out there, including Microsoft, where we built out a, a set of partnerships that were truly unique and that served the, the needs of, of the, the stadium and the team and and the fans all through technology. The pandemic really accelerated, I think, the, the willingness of, of sports teams and leagues and, and, and you know, media networks to try to do things differently. And you think about a company like our partner, NASCAR, who, has to work, who I used to work for, um, you know, they were the first ones to come back and do you know, virtual racing uh, in the middle of the pandemic. They were one of the first ones to have fans in the stands at a live event in a socially distanced way. And so that just shows you that they're, they're an innovation company at their heart. And they, they have been for a long time, but they, they had to accelerate some of those ideas that maybe they were thinking about for a long time. And uh, the disruption of the pandemic really changed a lot of the stuff in, in terms of what, what executives were willing to try. And so I think that opened the aperture for, for innovation in a, in a unique way. And we just happen to be really fortunate that our program launched in the middle of all that. And we're also super fortunate that Comcast at its heart, it's a family owned business. Correct. It's you know, founded by entrepreneurs, you know, yeah. and, and so they, they really thrive on innovation and, and they pride themselves on saying, you know what, we are looking to be different and, and be leading edge. And so they've given us at Boomtown the latitude to do things a little bit differently than some other companies might. 
And I applaud them for that immensely. And, and we thank them for that every day because uh, without the backing of Comcast and their, their perspective and how they operate this program uh, or they allow us to operate the program with them, it doesn't happen. You know, we don't, we're not able to do the things that we're doing on a day-to-day basis. So. Right. And I think that vision, right, of, of what mm-hmm. you're in still, what you're entrusted to do is a heavy one as well, right? You don't take it lightly. You, you've got these yeah. standard operating procedures that you bring, right, to yeah. find out where is the, where is the best use of technology for a particular problem? Where's the best use of funding for a particular technology to get to fix a certain problem, right? Um, and Suzanne, I'm going to hit it early, right? There's never been a better time to be a fan. <laughs> I, mean, it- I, I legit think that we just need to just go ahead and make that a drinking game. Like every time John says that. I think we, maybe we'll do a weekend edition where we can just do, just do drinking. Saturday drink. happy just, hour. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. yeah. 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 We can just pretend it's the weekend now and we can just sort of, sort of it's almost hit the weekend. I mean, it's five o'clock somewhere, as they say. Right? Yeah, that, so that might have to be our secret podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. We won't record that one now. No recording. Yeah. The after hours. Yeah, that one we will record. Yeah, There's no, a little that, inside that, joke that on that one, but uh, yeah. I'm trying to wipe the egg off my face on that one, right? So, uh, <laughs> Inside joke. Stay tuned for the behind the scenes uh, uh, edition on as to how that's relevant. But, <laughs> but one of the things that I've seen, and the pandemic is a is a, a good example of of how necessity has become the mother of invention, right? Especially for as you said, getting fans back into venues safely, securely, um, from a health perspective, and not only that, how do we then? maintain the experience that they've had on this virtual viewing, right? Or be not being able to be live, but still have that. How do we not detract from one experience, but bring the other experience back? And we've seen, uh, Suzanne and I speak to these a lot of these companies on a daily basis, right? People have had a real focus on fan experience. Now, sports tech is a huge, huge part of that. Um, and especially new ways of doing things. How do you see the fan experience play into not only your choices on who gets into a cohort, but also the choices of your downstream clients who pay attention to those co- cohorts that are fan experience focused. It's an interesting question in terms of, you know, what is the fan experience and what does a fan expect? Frankly, we're in the business of trying to, to spot things that the fans don't even know that they want and things that Comcast doesn't even know that they want. So I'll give you an example. I mean, we had a, a company in our last cohort called Let's Chat and they do translation services. And there's a lot of tr- translation services out there, but the difference is they, they can do live translations and they can do it multi-platform and they can do it instantaneously. And so there's, you know, so we, we heard that and we're like, wait a second, no one said they wanted translation services. But then when we put Let's Chat in front of the partners, they all said, yeah, I, I could potentially use that. So uh, our job is to not just uh, listen to what the fans tell us or what the teams or leagues tell us, it's to use our experience and, and think about ourselves in, in those avenues as someone who's either been a fan, you know, bringing my family to a game or someone who has watched the game from home or has surfed an app and had not had the great experience uh, or as great experience as you wanted or playing a sport or, you know, trying to improve your performance. So we try to put our, we try to empathize and put ourselves in, in the shoes of the end user. And our CEO, Toby has the, like he has the best lens on it. He said, we find technology to make people's lives better, right? So it's all about the people. And if the people don't enjoy it, they don't use it. It's not user-friendly and it doesn't meet. And we, a lot of people say, oh, we got to find something that solves a problem. I'm like, well, yeah, that's good. We should do that. But we also need to find things that uh, create improvements. And so there might, things might yeah. be just fine. You know, you might be sitting in the stadium going, you know what? The Wi-Fi is not great. That's okay. I'm, I'm satisfied with that. People complain about it, but, oh, well, it's just how it is, you know? And anytime I hear somebody say, oh, we'll never do X, my antenna goes up and I'm like, we need to find some tech to fix that. Whatever never is. Right. Let's um, get on that. We're, we're, we're never going to be able to, you know, get all these people back in the stadium next to each other. We're never going to be able to watch something on our phones and feel like we're there. So the fan engagement, fan experience is, is all about empathizing and thinking about, you know, if, if we were the fan, if we were the viewer, if we were the, the person who's trying to get their kid to perform better, like, what does that look like? And what would we want? And, and trying to go find stuff that, that, that fits that need. 
That's an awesome lens, right? And I think one of the things that that and I keep hopping on that that silly statement, right? It's never been a better time to be a fan, is because or a sports fan is because teams and leagues that that we interface with through partnerships such as as yours as well have that empathetic lens, have that lens now of okay, guess what? I if I'm an NFL team, I've got really eight days or nights to sell out tickets, and they sell out. Right. I'm selling a ticket whether whether I'm a I'm a top market team, middle market team, or or a starter team. But that's no longer the question. Right. The question that teams are coming to us and going, okay, we have people in the venue. How do we entertain them over and above what's happening on the field? Right. right. There's a reason that there's a whole atmosphere. There's, they've looked at, wow, what is happening in the tailgate? that isn't happening inside. And why do you have to go outside of our stadium to have that experience inside the stadium? That's a mismatch, right? And I think that empathetic lens helps close the bridge or close that gap a little bit. So I think one of the things that that is really interesting when I think of the startup world, or especially in the sports tech startup world, um, I was reading in TechCrunch about the NBCU partnership and what they were hoping to get out of this and why they came and chose Boomtown as the, the the guardian, right? As as their vision, can you tell me a little bit um, deeper as to why they came to you guys and what that relationship manifests itself in as a success criteria? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the relationship goes back a while; it predates me by a lot. So I, I don't know the early conversations very well, but what I do know is that the relationship started out many years ago, and it developed into a platform called the Farm, which was an accelerator program out of Atlanta, Georgia where we ran four cohorts for NBC and Boomtown is really good at operationalizing these things where, you know, working with the startups, many of the people that work for Boomtown have had, had their own startups. So again, they can empathize. They know what it's like to succeed, to fail. Our accelerator director, Ken, he's done it all. And so he's able to just to put that lens on how you train the startups and how you work with them and help them improve. And at our heart, we are a startup. Boomtown's a startup. So we can empathize that way too. You know, we're an early stage company. We're relatively small. But the pattern that that we saw, that Comcast saw when the farm started to get a little more mature and we got into year three and four is a lot of sports related technology companies coming through to the point where it was over indexing on, on sports themed companies. And so the idea was to go from more of a multi-platform or multi-sector accelerator program to something that's more sports specific. And so that's what prompted Comcast Sports Tech. And, and the genius of the program is really in the partners. I mean, Comcast did a great job of realizing that it's you can do a test with NBC Sports and you can prove that something works for NBC Sports, but, but NBC Sports has to interact with NASCAR and PGA Tour and WWE on a regular basis in order to implement. So if you don't have them at the table, you're not really doing the best by the startups. You know, it's more efficient to test in conjunction with one another because it's a true partnership and it's matrixed. So they designed it, brought Boomtown in to help with the early stage design of what the program should look like to, to figure out how the partner should be integrated. And then the pandemic hit and, and put the brakes on the first cohort. And then we went virtual and then I came on board. And so uh, about 15 months ago, I came on board. And, and the, the thing that I'm just amazed by is just the, the quality of the people at Boomtown and my colleagues are all super experienced and really smart and, and we're, we're, re we're able to do things differently because we have a different perspective and we want, we're, always, we're all about making sure that it's an awesome experience for the, for the startups and the partners and Comcast. And so uh, we've got to balance all of that. And Boomtown was really good at that before the sports tech platform came along, before I even came along. I was able to add my lens from a sports expertise perspective and and help them navigate the, the world of sports a little bit more efficiently. And so it's been really cool to see. And, and Comcast has, has been amazing in terms of what they, they've been stepping up constantly in terms of their executives, helping the startups, coaching the startups, and uh, getting more and more involved as time goes on in the selections process and working on, on proofs of concept, et cetera. So. Yeah, that's fantastic. Being able to really speak to this growing niche, this growing technology area, and really providing a ton of value. And so thinking about that a little bit, when when you're looking at applicants, when you're looking at, you know, who's ultimately going to make up this cohort, what does that process look like? What are the, the, the key things that you're looking for when you're like, this is the startup that I want to invest the time and energy in? And, and quite frankly, how do you get the applicants in the first place? Do they find you? Do you find them? 
Well, in, in year one, when you don't really have a, a track record, it, it's about outreach and marketing and, and all those things. Before I even came, there was a really smart marketing group and, uh, and our CEO is a marketer. So they, they put together an awesome uh, marketing plan. But really, it's it, over the last 24 months, we've learned a lot about the types of startups and the types of companies that are going to do the best in the program. And frankly, that, are, that the partners and Comcast are going to really want to work with the most. So typically, an accelerator program goes after companies that are idea stage, maybe pre-product, pre-revenue, and tries to get them to where they have a product and some revenue and some investment. What we discovered, though, is the partners are they're ready and willing and able to work with these, these companies right away. So if they have to wait six months for the prototype to be built, it, it's not really optimal for them. And so our program now is becoming less of an accelerator in the traditional sense and more of a innovation platform designed to take relatively early stage companies, but more mature companies that have some revenue, have some customers, maybe they've got uh, a decent sized staff, that sort of thing, a, pr a product that can be tested right away. And maybe even a commercial deal can be executed very quickly. And so some of the companies in our last cohort were a little bit more mature. They had those customers. They, they had a prototype that was working. And so the, the number of, of uh, proofs of concept really uh, quintupled it within the program. We started out with 10 possible proofs of concept, one, one per partner. Uh, and then we came out of a program we did in Texas where we all got around a table and collaborated. And there was over 50 potential opportunities. And, you know, we're at, we're at over 60 POCs and commercial deals um, to date with our two cohorts, which is pretty, pretty substantial. And so we, when you get more mature companies that can operate, you know, more quickly, you're able to do more deals. And we want to focus on revenue generation more than investment because the revenue generation is important to the right investors, right? So an investor many times will say, well, what's your revenue? And if you don't have any, they're like, hmm, okay, never mind. Come back to me when you have some. Um, so we want to try to help accelerate these tests through the platform we're building. But it's not, uh, it, and, and so the other thing that we, we realized is it's not just sports tech companies that we want. We want companies that can execute really well in the sports industry, but that have broader applicability to other industries. Like you think about uh, some of the companies that we brought on uh, like Tip Tap Sports, you know, they had been doing business in the charitable space, collecting charitable donations and, and one tap increments for a couple of years. And then we thought this could be great because there's so much philanthropy that goes on in sports, but then they can also work with private foundations and different companies that are raising funds for, for charities. Like, you know, they can go work for, for a fast food restaurant, raise funds and then give it to whatever their charity of choice is. So those companies that, that have their tech companies that can do well in sports as opposed, as opposed to companies that are purely designed for sports. Um, and it doesn't mean we're going to be absolute in all those, those evaluations. You know, we will take some companies that are more sports specific, uh, but it really hinges on the process, which is we, we interview hundreds of companies. We give the top 55 ranked companies to our partners. They rank the companies in a virtual environment, they look at materials, they look at application links and things like that. They rate the top 55. We then go collectively interview the top 20 to 25 in a call like this. And then we take all these notes, we record all the sessions, and then we tabulate the results and we pick a company on the back end. So last year we had hundreds of data points from, from hundreds of executives, VP and above at, at uh, a dozen companies. That, could, that gave us this, this lens on what they want. And the number one question we focus on is, does the partner want to work with that company in the program and beyond to do a deal? And if no one's raising their hand, no one get, they don't get through the second stage. If one or two companies raise their hand and say, yeah, I want to work with that startup, they might get through the second round. But we want more partners to raise their hand. And if we have a situation where five or more partners can raise their hand, then they become the top 10 and we make the offers and things like that. So it's, it's that partner fit that's really critical um, to, to success. You, you kind of have to go through that rigor. Like if you're, if you're not ready to go through the rigor of, of, of this, you know, you're, you're not going to make it. You know? <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. If you can go through that gauntlet, then you're probably not going to succeed as a startup. Because there's a lot of, a lot of gauntlets to run. When you're exactly. It's, this is probably a good gut check at that point. If you wouldn't mind, could you, could you walk me through, like they've gone through this gauntlet, they've gone through this process. The partners are like, we need to invest in this right away. What does that 
period when they're in the program and then ultimately when they, you know, graduate, so to speak, what, what does that look like? Yeah, that's great. Great question too. Cause we're, we're changing that as well. So one, one thing that you can, so it's really interesting. Like we, we are trying to innovate innovation because our, our opinion is if you just do the same thing every year, are you really innovative? Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> right? so we're, so we're, we're always experimenting. That's one of our favorite words. And we're testing and learning ourselves and we're growing. And so one of the experiments that we're looking at is, is how do you build the most effective relationships with these new companies? And so we did some new things this year. We're going to do some more new things next year. And one of those things that we wanted to do was, was create an environment where the partners could provide a testimonial in person about how great the startup is that they're working with. And get the other partners to say, oh, wait, I can work with that company, too. And so what we did last year, there's an onboarding period where we negotiate for stock in the companies. We bring them on board. We sign. We do all get their corporate books in order and make the investment. And then what we do is we quickly start looking at who has signed and which companies express the strongest interest in working with which startups. And we start a partner matchmaking process. And then that partner assigns an executive to be the customer advisor for that startup. And then the onboarding process is book seats. Here's your partner. Here's who you're going to work with. And, uh, and then the partner here, here's book seats. You know, this is the company you're going to work with. Let's think about what that POC looks like. What do you need to get that done? And one thing that we discovered is, you know, we, we kind of knew it, but it, it just dawned on us uh, more so in the last 12 months is it takes a long time to get a deal done with a big company. You guys know that, right? So there's, there's, there's privacy and security assessments, there's procurement uh, hurdles that you get. There's contracts to negotiate. There's insurance requirements to, to navigate. Oh, yeah. We know so, we know that very intimately. <laughs> I'm starting to twitch a little bit here. That's not the video. <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 that may not be the funnest part of the job, but it's necessary, right? As a former lawyer, I'm like, I applaud the efforts to be cautious, right? So, but, um, but it just takes a while, right? So even doing a, a POC with a big company, uh, one of our partners, it just, it just takes a while to get. There. So we're going to start that process earlier and we're going to make sure that those, those deals are lined up sooner. And then we have a, you know, six to eight week onboarding process where they, they really get to know the partner and they get to know each other in the cohort and figure out uh, what the best alignments are. And then we go to an in-person event last year we went to Texas and there happened to be a NASCAR race, a PGA tour, the Valero open WrestleMania was in Dallas, uh, in Arlington. And then the golf channel also was on site for, for production. So we had four partners executing on site and we, we went behind the scenes and, but the magic happened in a ballroom in Austin, Texas, where we put together all these folks and, and had a really deliberately designed session to, to help accelerate their relationship building and, and their deal making. And so that was our first experiment and it worked so well, we're going to do it again. And uh, what we're also looking at is, you know, after that, we, we want to build a longer term relationship with these companies, because even after they get their first deal done, we're invested in them, we're aligned. And so as they the, the graduation really is going to be less of a of a, a, a stopping point, more of a starting point for us where, um, you know, they'll still go through the curriculum and they'll still learn and we'll still have a relationship. But we're not going to necessarily do a demo day at 12 weeks. We're going to do a public kind of event later on. That's going to be, it's still being designed, uh, but it's, it's, it's designed to be further out so we can get more traction. We can give ourselves more time to build the relationships, get the deals done and also set the tone that, that, you know, it's, you know, you become an alumni, but it's, it's an emeritus kind of thing where we're going to, we're going to continue to be on the lookout. I mean, I, I talked to our, our first two cohorts on a, on a, you know, daily, weekly basis and say, hey, I just I just thought about this, and like you should meet this person, and um, always trying to help them find that next uh, lead or or get them involved with the next potential good discussion with either an official partner or an unofficial partner, because we know the, the official partners get a first look and they're very intimately involved. But you can't build a, a new company off of ten deals, right? You, got, you might have to have hundreds or thousands of deals. So we want to have our startups working with you know, like the Braves are a great example of. They're right there at our near our office in Atlanta, and they're amazing to work with. And I've known them a long time. And our and the Comcast leadership knows their leadership really well. So it's one of those things that even though the Braves aren't broadcast on on NBC Sports or anything like that, there are certain things we've been able to do with them uh, just because they they've been uh, good friends for a long time. And so there's an unofficial partner roster that's always growing. You know, we're always looking for people to work with 
for the startup's sake. And so we're uh, we're pretty pretty excited to continue to grow those relationships even after the program is quote unquote over. It's, it's the curriculum's done. So whoever said uh, relationships don't matter don't get it. Pretty right. Much. I mean, so I love the the term that you used. You're innovating innovation. Right. So what we do on a daily basis, it, I, I, I find a lot of analogous behavior on our side of the world as well. But we are, quite frankly, big tech. Right. We're classified as big tech and we're with a big serve many um, type of company here, even though we did start in the garage. We're, we're pretty far from that. Right. But I like to think that we've retained our entrepreneurial spirit. Um, Suzanne and I manifest that every single day and, and we try and innovate innovation. It's a phenomenal term. So yeah. thank you. Stolen. There we go. Um, what are the things invoice for royalties soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Checks in the mail, yeah. so to speak, right? Hey, John, you, can, you kind of set yourself up there. We're talking there to you. <laughs> I did. I did. I, did. And, and I also wrote down the term here. Um, I, I do appreciate the, uh, the, um, the caution. Right. So as a lawyer, I do appreciate the, the level of caution there. So um, one thing I, I wanted to to touch on, Chris, is where do you see that relationship between big tech and startups? Right. Because mm, yeah. they are they are very different if you're looking at them from the outside looking in. But we play in the same field. Right. Mm -hmm. We go after the same partnerships that you do. We, we complement right. each other in that. How do you see that working in, in your world today? Yeah, well, it's it's a it's a great, really interesting kind of dynamic that I see. Um, so you have big tech companies, and and you guys, you, you know, you see thousands of startups all the time. Correct. Yep. You're, you're you're providing your services to startups all the time. Yep. The tough thing is, it's it's a big ocean out there. There's a ton of companies, and there's new ones developing all the time. Which ones are going to make it? Which ones are not going to make it? And what's the difference? And and who knows what the difference is in terms of uh, the day to day. And so, you know, I, I like to think of it this way. There's really smart people in, in tech that have a roadmap and, and they're executing on that roadmap and their budget is approved for that roadmap and, and they can execute that. You know, you guys are really great at, at finding tech and building it. In. It's how do we create a new step on the roadmap using startups? How do we find that one thing that you didn't even know that you needed or your customer needed because we thought, okay, well, we've experienced some pain point or we see some trend, you know, we're always reading new articles and we, we, get, we gather a ton of research and we distribute that to our partners. We're very um, metric driven. And so how do we, you know, if you think about that fan experience and, and if we find a good idea, um, how do we help that startup rise above? How do we help them position themselves so that when they call someone at Microsoft and say, hey, I'm one of your 10,000 startups that's using your cloud-based system, but here's what makes me different. And here's why you should pick me to be someone you go deep with. And our job is to spot those people and then coach them up and help them navigate and be on the phone when they're fumbling about and they don't know how to answer the tough question from the CTO or the SVP of, of technology or the engineer or whoever they're talking to. So that's the special sauce for us is like, how do we translate? Because the big company thinks in one way and operates in one way. And the smaller companies going like, well, why don't they return my emails? Well, because they have 9,000 emails a day. Correct. And, so that's the, and, and when you, when you send that email and it says, Hey, I'm so-and-so and I'm from Wisconsin, like you've already lost them. Like you literally have five <laughs> seconds to get their attention. <laughs> yeah. So how do you do that? And then how do you keep their attention and that's part of our program is we're working with these companies and it's very situational, right? So it all depends on what the need is and what they're trying to do and how they describe the tech and how they describe how they can help the person they're pitching to. And it's trial and error. And there are some of those calls that go really well and some of those calls that don't go well. Right. And, and so how do we help more of those calls go well for both? of So we're the translator in some ways. We're the recruiter. We go out and find these startups, but then we need to be translating between the big company talk and the small company talk and, and the startup person might go, that was an amazing call. And I'm like, yes, but I heard this one thing. Right. And if you don't do this other than like, well, I didn't hear that. Like I heard this one thing and so that's you might the want point. To, do this, to address this one thing and go back and respond. And so it's, it's how do we help them translate and help, how do we help them frankly be more patient? You know, these startups, they want to do business yesterday. Yeah. And there's no deal that happens, you know, once you get above a thousand employees, there's no deal that happens in, in less than three months. 
no just, not realistically right certainly not of any value or any long-term value right you'd be a one-shot deal i think one of the things that that that's and, and why i'm super high on on accelerators and in in our space specifically on boomtown right because you're the translator or the spell check right for value right it's because you're right we get 3,000 emails every single week from i presume amazing companies but i don't have the bandwidth I don't have the time to come and respond to even, or quite frankly, to even read every single one of these things that come in. Mm-hmm. But I know in between those sort of haystack there, there's some some real, real good needles that we need to pull out of there because they are the, the tip of the spear that we need to be. Totally messed up all of those little analogies and put them all together, but it, it'll work. We'll go with it, right? Um, yeah. So I'm super high on accelerators there because you do see both sides of the of the the coin there right is you understand that there's a a willingness to go and dip into the startup market from big tech to fill gaps that we have right we may have a little gap here and there or also because as we as we get deeper with a client they look at us as an advisorial capacity as well what have you seen here what have you seen there and if we don't do something or that's just not our value work Let's get someone in to do that. And then we'll look to other companies and we'll look to to, to Boomtown and, and the like to say, well, we've already done the validation. Yeah, You're not yeah. sitting here and putting someone in front of this client who's going to three months down the line go, I'm nowhere. I, I'm exactly where we started three months ago. And that's a bad look for everybody, right? Mm-hmm. So there is a question in this meandering um, talk track that I got here <laughs> is how do you understand what's going to hit for which client that is you're talking to you we've gone through the the cohort we've been promoted to the top 10 we've got five plus partners that want to try it out they've done the poc maybe there's a commercial deal or two in there but when you want to start broadening that aperture and going wider how do you see that fit with the relationships that you mentioned braves etc how do you see that fit for your your stable mates yeah, that, that's that's where we are today with cohort one and two. And uh, and that's been a learning process too. It, you know, constantly having conversations with with people in the sports industry. So I and and I I'm I probably, you know, even when I was at Bank of America, I would take calls that most people wouldn't take because I wanted to hear what people had to say about what's going on. So even though I knew I wasn't buying the sponsorship from XYZ NFL team, I would still spend an hour with them saying, What's going on with your fan base? And how do you measure that? And what are your sponsor roster doing? So in this case, I'm, I'm constantly talking to people across the sports industry, regardless of sector, both our partners and, and unofficial partners and just friends of mine and saying, well, what are you seeing and what could you use and, and trying to figure out what those intersect points are. And here's the thing. No one's going to bat a thousand on that matchmaking. And so, I mean, there, there have been introductions that I've tried to make where I'm like, hey, we've got this cool company. I think they could help you this way. And somebody's like, yeah, no, thanks. I'm like, OK, but I appreciate a quick no. There's nothing worse than, than the silence. Yes. And, and then the next worst thing is a slow no. So I'll take a slow, you know, of course, everyone wants the quick yes. Slow yes is okay. Quick no is fine. Like quick no Sometimes is Sometimes more valuable. Sometimes yeah. more valuable. Especially if it's company, accompanied by no and here's why. Yes. And then you can address either, either they misunderstood it and you can say, well, actually, that's not true. And here's how it works. And maybe you should still have the conversation. Or it's, oh, well, we can't do that, but maybe we, should, we can reconfigure what we're building to, to meet that need and, and learn from it. So we're all about learning and trial and error. And, you know, the, we don't expect all of our companies to, to get every conversation right or to, do, to, to close every deal. And that's why you got to fill the funnel at the top with a lot of conversations, right? So when I first came in, I was nervous because I was like, okay, we have one partner and one startup and is this going to work? And and, and that was how we originally designed it. And then we said, you know what? Actually, it's way better when we've got one startup and five partners, because then if one of those things hits, then we're OK. And so that's that's why we, we've redesigned it a little bit and, and tried to bring in. We brought in two new partners, PGA Tour and WWE, and they've been phenomenal. So we've, we've broadened the, the partner roster. We've gotten more engaged with different NBC and Comcast business units. That's been really helpful. So you've got more customers to talk to. And then you've got these these startups who who potentially can do business with as many partners as possible. And what's that broader applicability? Like a company like Yuru Sports, I mean, they can work with any HR organization on the planet. They just want to start in sports because they're athletes and they know the difference between athletes and regular people and, at a high level. And they, they believe there's a, a, a better talent pool within the athlete pool that people don't recognize and more diverse pool and things like that. 
we're going to increase our odds of success by having these more diverse companies from different sectors that have a broader platform to solve for HR, travel, translation, charitable fundraising that happen to do stuff in sports, but we're still not going to bat a thousand. We're not, we may not even bat 500, but we got, so we, if you fill the funnel with 20 deals and they get three of them done, they're like, okay, great. And that's, that's just, and that's where like kind of my sales genes come in. I'm like, it's okay. We don't, we don't need to hit everything. We just need to be creative and be, be efficient. And like, let's not waste anyone's time with a conversation and know that it's an easy no. Let's go to the ones we think really should be a good fit. And, and we'll, we might hear no because of timing or because they just found a, a similar solution last week that we didn't know about. But our batting average is pretty good. And, and uh, there's a lot to talk about. We've got a lot of deals in the pipeline. So that's amazing. And, and I think that's a, it's, it's, it's sales 101. It's like you want to fill your funnel yeah. and you want to be very quick and judicious about like, let's. <laughs> You know, like if there's no way whatsoever that this is even going to see the light of day, like let's let's not invest the time, the money, the re let's let's keep it moving, keep it moving. Well, and, and I've worked with some startups in the past in my consulting career where where they'd get really myopic. They would say, "Oh, we've got this amazing opportunity with this giant company, all hands on deck, and let's put all of our energy into this one pitch." And they would consume the whole team for weeks getting ready for one pitch, and that and then it went nowhere. And then there's super frustrated because like, oh my gosh, we just wasted a month doing one pitch. You got to be efficient at that whole process of, of going back and doing the pitch, learning, pivoting, come right back, you know, be able to address the, the uh, concerns. And, and then also know when things are not going to work out. Some, there's some really nice people out there that have a hard time saying no. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When you were talking about silence, I, the phrase that came in my head was deafening silence. It's just like, no, I, I, right. I get it. <laughs> And one of the things that I've gotten pretty, and, and maybe I'm a little bit too uh, open about it, but like if somebody hasn't responded to one of our startups in like three weeks, I'll just shoot them a note on the side and say, hey, they really want to work with you. But if, if you don't want to work with them, that's okay. Just say so. Right. And nine times out of 10, they come back and like, no, we're going to have a call. I was just busy. I was on vacation. I got sick, whatever. And, and so, but it's, you know, like, let's not waste anyone's time. And, and with all due respect, it's like, let's just not have another call if there's no fit there. Because there's only so many hours in the day exactly. for both the big company and the small company. Yes. And so well, let's let's find where there's the most excitement, the most energy, the most desire to follow up. And let's move fast with the ones that will move fast. And that seems to be working pretty well. Yeah. And it, it, it's something that I like to say often, like I can always make money, but I can't get time back. Time is the one resource I cannot get back. Oh, sure. <laughs> That should be a t-shirt, right? So we'll put that on the next merchandising thing, right? Oh, <laughs> of course, I like money, but I can't make time. I like I'll that. I'm going to keep saying this as that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chris, it's been it's been phenomenal uh, talking with you and getting to know more about the great work that uh, you and Boomtown are doing. As we wrap up, is are, are there any success stories that resonate for you? Like you just beam when you when you think about it and you're willing to share with us. Yeah, there, there's, there's, I mean, so many of our companies are doing really well. And it's, it's one of those things like the Oscars thank you speech, like, am I going to leave somebody out? Right. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a couple of recent examples, like Moneyline just announced that um, Austin Eckler and Roddy White have come on as investors. And it's a, it's a, a casual gamers platform. They, they're doing extremely well. Um, Kelly Proct with InVenue continues to amaze me with, with what she's doing in the sports gambling space and predictive analytics and her deal with Apple TV for MLB on Friday nights. Uh, Brennan and the team from Dibs, they're doing amazing work in Canada with the Bell Music Festivals and doing surprise and delights with, with uh, brands. Um, you know, we've got Carlos with XIQ. He's, he's gone international. He's, he's got a product that can turn on any non-automotive ignition from a, from a smartphone. Uh, and he's doing boat deals and scissor fork deals and scissor lift deals and forklift deals. Sorry. Um, and so there's just so many of our alumni. Jay, Jay Headley has built a really cool immersive uh, video platform that he's testing out with the corn Ferry tour and, and the golf channel and uh, book seats. They they're launching a, a pilot right now where you can book your tea times and your hotels all in one place. When you do your travel golf vacations around the world, I could go down the row and just like there are 20 companies. They're all doing amazing things. And they're all finding their own pace. You know, some people are moving at faster paces, but they're all doing really well, really great work and learning a lot. It's kind of like, you know, the proud parent syndrome where like I, I have a hard time saying anything bad about anybody. <laughs>
That's cool. Though. I think one of the things that a lot of people who don't work in sports as a provider to the industry don't actually understand or don't see very clearly is that the product that you see on the court, the pitch, the diamond, the field, whatever it is, is a very small portion of the actual business it takes to present that, mm -hmm. right? So the product is supported to your point. You were talking about HR, you were talking about tickets, you're yeah. talking about booking, right? You're talking about all these I will, I'm going to say regular, and I don't mean that disparaging, right? but all these regular business units that any organization would have, they also exist in sports, right? There may be a different lens to it. There may be a different tenure to it. There may be a different cadence to it, but all of that has to hit. Otherwise, that product that's on the field, the diamond, the pitch, the court, whatever it is, doesn't hit, right? And then that's the death knell, right? So I think the things that, that again, I'm, I'm super high on, on, on companies such as yours is that you get to see the entire breadth of getting a product to the field right or getting a product to the racetrack for example and and i think it's an enviable position because i just think it's awesome right um and you get to see so much of the facets of it right but i think ultimately it is entirely necessary because one of the things you say translation spell check whatever it is there's a lot of noise out there right because it is such an attractive industry for people to just parachute in and go nah, that didn't work and they're out but the conversations yeah. that someone invests in a startup or even big tech to do something for their sports team is a big investment, even if it's just their time, right? Because sports teams are typically made up of very small, very small teams that do very right. big things, yes. right? So I think you're providing not only value to the companies trying to enter the business, but also for the business itself, because they don't have 24 hours in a day, quite frankly, to do what they need. They have to fit 38 hours into 24, and then they're just starting to scratch the surface. So I think, um, what you guys do is amazing. We see the benefits of it. Obviously, the industry sees the benefits of it. Um, and I'm super thankful, Chris, that you came on the show today um, twice, but we'll talk about that later. But uh, <laughs> um, but thank you. And and thank you for making yourself available and telling some of these success stories. I could go on for another two years, but um, I know we all have uh, a limited time to go do all the other stuff that we do. But again, thank you. Thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. No, I, I really appreciate the chance to talk about what we do and and uh, I hope that anybody that's listening, if you're interested in learning more about Boomtown and about, you know, innovation and how we do it, whether you're a sports organization and you want to find new startups or whether you're a startup and you want to figure out how to get in with NASCAR or the PGA Tour, please reach out. You know, that's that's why we're here. We want to help continue to find the great companies and continue to make an impact on the sports industry so that when my kids go to a game, they don't have to wait in line anymore and uh, they can uh, interact with their fan on their app better and they can buy the t-shirt easier right so yeah chris you, you you literally stole the words right out of my mouth my next question was going to be if they want to find out more about the amazing work that you're doing where can they go so is there any specific resource you want to point people to yeah absolutely for for the sports tech program comcastsportstech.com um so you'll find information about our partners and the platform and how to apply and we just uh we just closed our application window for cohort three but we're always taking applications for for next year and we're always trying to get to know new companies. So please visit there and, and reach out to us through the website. And if you want to just learn more about Boomtown, uh, it's Chris at BoomtownAccelerators.com. You can email me there. And, you know, if you want to talk more about just innovation in general, I'm happy to have that discussion too. So. Awesome, Chris. Thank you so much. And we'll definitely be sure to include that in the episode notes. But um, it's been a real pleasure. And thank you so much for, for sharing this. I, I definitely want to take the opportunity to, to learn more. John, any final, any final thoughts? No, I'm well, only about three hours worth, but yeah, we'll put all the links in, in the stuff below and then click this link, subscribe now, all that kind of stuff and get used to this video medium. But just again, thank you for, for the time that, that you spent with us today, right? And I'm like, super excited to see how these cohorts um, come out of the program and, and onto the great things that they do and um, look at the new cohorts that you have coming in. So again, thanks, Chris. Thanks very much. Really appreciate the time. Have a great day. Thank you. And with that, we'll uh, bring our podcast to a close. Uh, but we always welcome any feedback that you may have on this episode and future uh, episodes, including topics. So feel free to reach out to John and myself. Until next time, take care and we'll see you soon.